Hello, I'm Somi Aryan. I'm the founder of the Think Tank for Women in Business and Technology and the FemPeak platform with the mission of raising women's socioeconomic status. This movement was born out of a dream to see women in the top tier of business, technology, science, arts, philosophy, and more. I'm talking about having female counterparts of Plato to Picasso, Newton to Einstein, Steve Jobs to Bill Gates. For too long, our society has suffered from a lack of female perspective. That's why they call it history and not her story. It's time to change that narrative. But we cannot achieve this without a great dose of self-belief and focused energy to make the right move in the moments that matter. And that's what I'm going to be talking about with our guest on today's podcast. Sarah Monroe is a leadership performance coach and the author of The Shed Method. Sarah was also a panelist at our first conference for women in business and technology, where her three minutes remarks proved super popular with our attendees who wanted to hear more from her. So here's my conversation with Sarah Mera. In the conference, I had you at the, as the last person because you yeah. were going to be talking about the self, you know, the psychological aspect of how women can help themselves succeed, essentially, you know. Do you mind maybe giving us a, a recap of what you said? And then I'm sure a lot of questions will out that and come out of that. My main point in this is that there's many things that we can't control, but there's a lot of things we can control. And so a lot of the work that I'm doing with senior women and men too, actually, is helping them focus on what they can control. A, because it's more energizing, and B, human beings crave progress. In the current situation and in you know many pressures that people are working under, it's, it's difficult to remember that, uh, but actually we can still make progress. The main point is that if we can help each other and ourselves focus on what we can control, we are probably more likely to be able to then push forward and actually achieve things that maybe even ourselves felt was pretty difficult or tricky or, or maybe even impossible. So it's focusing on the sort of small incremental points that actually prove to you that you can actually keep making small moments of progress that, that help you to feel strong, powerful, empowered, whatever word works for you. So that's in a way, and that's about effort and it's about practice. And it's also about being really deliberate around where you pay attention. And I think that's the most important thing right now because everybody, I mean, there's a massive energy crisis for absolutely everybody that I'm working with, that we're working with in organizations, in the system, but in each individual, there's a, there's a performance, massive energy performance challenge here. There's a lot of energy going into sort of plans, but actually, in my view, we need to be putting in a lot of energy around energy plans. You know, what's the energy plan? What's the energy plan for you as an individual? What's the energy plan for you and your team? What's the energy plan for you and your business in the broader sense of the world? So I'm in the business of helping people be deliberate about where they want to pay attention and to hold on to the energy that they have and place it in the areas that can make the biggest difference. So what if you have too many things that they all seem important? My day job, as you know, is a marketing agency. I work with companies like Steinway Pianos, you know, NeuroCore Bioelectronics. So we create their social media content. Obviously that's my day job and I've got a team of five, six people. I'm the kind of person that I always have to have side hustles. Even my side hustles have side hustles. I've always been like that, whether I've worked for another company, whether uh, I run my own business. So like, for example, 2017, I started working on my documentary, The Millennial Disruption. That was, that took me about 18 months to do. 2019, I spent the whole year writing a book while, and this was while I was running my business. And now I'm setting up the, the think tank and femme talent. I feel like I need pressure, but how can I manage it? Is there a way to have like a more managed chaos? You know, that, you know because, <laughs> because, you know, because yeah. chaos brings out my creative juices, of right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. And I think that you make a really important point, right? Because this is all individual. And I think resilience and habits, whatever we want to call it, has to be what works for you. And what I know of you, Sony, is that you're very driven, but also that gives you a load of energy. That drive gives you energy. So it's not about stopping doing what you absolutely want to do. And I would also argue that all of your side hustles are all joined up. Actually, if you went up to the top, if you lathered them up, there's an overall purpose. And I think that's the key thing is because you can see the dots and they're all joined up and they're ultimately going somewhere. They're just like little mini 
spheres of things that you're doing right now. But I think what gives you the energy is the overall shared intent, right? And that's what I call purpose energy. And the, the wonderful thing about purpose energy, particularly if it's beyond self-interest, and I think, you know, you have got a big beyond self-interest cause here that's driving you, is it's a massive source for us as human beings to achieve more than we, we think possible. And it's wonderful. The watch out is that with any performance energy driver, you have to also refuel and recover in order to have enough energy to be able to keep driving that. So the thing I'd say to you is you probably know the big signs, the first signs where you are just tipping the balance from being driven, purposeful, loving it, absolutely, you know, 110% in there. You probably know, if you were really honest, Somi, you probably know the first sign and it will be a body sign probably. Your body will give you a little bit of a, hang on, watch out, Somi, just put some more fuel in the tank here, girl, because you've got a long way to go. <laughs> you've got a big intent. You've got a big purpose. So make sure that you're in it for the long, the long term. And, you know, we can all sprint and then recover, sprint and then recover. But most of us are in marathons right now, really strong, purposeful marathons. And I think you are, which in, within your marathon, you've got mini sprints that come up, right? It's about being really clear with yourself around what the first signs are and what makes a difference to your refuel. And that will be different for you. It will be different for me. It will be different for anybody listening here. But it's about being a scientist on your own behavior and your own performance and understanding it as you go through it. And you understand it by pushing the boundaries and, and you'll keep doing that and you'll keep fine tuning all along. But the key is not to make it burn you out. That's the thing. And people have different pressure points. So what's pressure for you might be absolute overwhelm for someone else. That's fine. It's just, again, I mean, I'm a real believer in positive pressure. Part of the um, challenge for me during lockdown is that I, I've missed that, that sort of drive of that extra little thing, that extra pressure that you might get when you have to be in one place and then you have to be in another place and then you have to be over here and you have to jump on a plane. You know, all of that can be very addictive. But at the same time, it can also give you huge purpose. For me, the purpose energy is the most useful and also it can trump any of the other energies because it can just keep you going. The downside is, how do you notice? And I mean, the question I'd ask you, Sammy, how do you notice? What's the first sign for you when you think, actually, I'm just probably tipped over here some, somewhat? So I have never in my lifetime, I have never, ever got to a point that I felt like, I am so tired or whatever that I'm losing my drive. Never. I have never, like, I don't know what it feels like to not have drive. So you're doing something that works for you, hey? You really need to just know yourself, you know? Yes. In my book, I have a whole chapter about knowing yourself. I think I know myself so well. So for example, for many people, it would be completely mad when I say, this was like my day of having a break on Saturday. I was so tired that I decided to spend the whole day in bed. I literally just like had the, the light dim and I stayed in bed. So but when you hear up to here, you think, okay, like she's like the, the next sentence, you know, I texted you. The next sentence comes like, and I spent the whole day in bed practicing linear algebra and Python. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But for me, that is but relaxing. Cool, right? Exactly. And you know, some <laughs> people get on a bike, cycle for 40 kilometers. You know, other people will, will read all day in bed. Other people will just go and walk. It actually doesn't matter as long as you know what it is. So what I'm hearing is you, you decided to bed into something that fundamentally relaxes you, but at the same time keeps you incredibly interested in what you're doing. There are no rules. And I think the problem sometimes is that we try and make these rules and then feel bad because we're not adhering to them. It's just about what, what works for you. And a lot of the people that I'm working with have got very lots of other people demanding things of them. To be fair, you've always said to me, so you've made some decisions in your life, in your personal life, so as not to have that, not to have that pressure coming in. But a lot of people are as driven as you, but have also got other people needing things, wanting things. And I think that is what sometimes pushes people over the, the edge. So would you say that for women in particular, there is more of that? Because for example, from my observation, it seems like when a man is in a, you know, in a scientific or in, in a business environment where they have to focus on something, they just tell their family, guys, I need to do this. And everybody's yeah. like, shh, 
you know, daddy needs to do that, right? From my experience, you said that I made some decisions and I, I always talk about it quite openly. I made the decision not to have children so that mm. I could pursue what I want to pursue. I find that even when I decided not to have children, if I've been, say, for example, in a relationship with somebody who has had children, there has still been the requirement of like, you would need to give a certain amount of time to the family, to children. And that's really lovely. But at the same time, in a way, I'm tr what I'm trying to say is that, would you agree that maybe women are making to, are having to make more sacrifice to balance that kind of demand from other people? Because I think that there is a natural tendency from everybody in our culture to expect a woman to be more available to help, be around, to be more nurturing. And when you don't do that and you say, you know what, I'm going to spend all day in bed practicing math and, and, and mm. Python, <laughs> you know, that's like, that's like, like what? Like, yes. you know, uh, so yeah. that's why you then end up having to make the kind of sacrifices that I have had to make. But I just wonder whether that's one of the things that sort of maybe holding women back it's difficult to make sweeping generalizations. I would say out of, the, out of the women that we work with, there are on the whole more women who are dealing with that sort of double responsibility, triple responsibility sometimes, because there's the whole parents, you know, aging parents is in there as well, potentially more than men. Although I think, you know, that I think that's shifting actually for, for many. And I know that there are many women that I work with, and I put myself in this uh, bucket as well, who have partners who take who have taken on a lot of responsibility in terms of running the house looking after the children taking picking up children in support of my career so i think this is definitely becoming different and shifting but i still would say that on the whole if i look at the clients that i'm working with now most of them are having to do quite a lot of family stuff responsibilities in fact i, I was speaking to a woman two weeks ago who literally she is superb at getting everything done by five o'clock and for her five o'clock is a deadline but as a consequence her deliberateness and her is enviable within the team because she is so deliberate and dedicated to what she can do and protecting her time and she's ruthless around people who waste her time because her her purpose is making sure that she's available for her young people at the end of the day her children at the end of the day so therefore that's a purpose that drives her to be really, really committed and deliberate during the day and expects other people to start meetings on time and finish meetings on time and stick to their, their promises and their commitments. So it's a difficult question to answer in one fell sort of general response, but I think it's definitely shifting. And I think there's some men that have got full-time responsibility, family responsibilities as well. I work with single men who have got the, the same dual responsibility. But I do feel that on the whole, that is the case still, yeah. That's definitely, it's not a sweeping generalization. There's actually a lot of research done. And there's a lot of work done by McKinsey, for example, yes. on, on this particular thing around women's unpaid responsibilities. It's definitely a case, it's been documented pretty well. So my worry is how that's going to impact women in business and technology because, yeah. because now we are developing technologies that they're moving so fast. And it means that if women are not at the table, when those decisions are made or when yeah. those technologies are made, that's a, a serious problem because it means that we will continue with these algorithms that have this kind of biases of lack of women, you know, is there a way you see, do you see that maybe technology could find solutions or can we use technology to kind of offload some of the responsibilities if more technology was developed by women it could yeah. be right now i'm looking at the reason why i'm learning python is because i want to try and uh, automate a lot of my daily stuff and and yes. i feel like encouraging my team to learn it and it, it's actually not that difficult you know once it's just like learning a language you know you just need to have a daily practice and it's really not that difficult and when you start learning and thinking about is there stuff that i can automate to make my life easier if it buys me 10 minutes or yes. half an hour per day and i think that those technologies are not going to be developed by men because they don't know the mm. things that maybe yeah. women Need. deal with 
I think absolutely. I think that would be, I think I love the fact that you said, you know, even if it buys you back 10 minutes, even if it buys you back half an hour, mm -hmm. there's two benefits there. A, it protects your mind energy because then you can focus on actually having the impact that you want to have, you know, your work or whatever it is that you want to be part of. And also it gives you back some time so yeah. that you can choose to, to do things differently. I mean, you'd know much better than me, Sony, how that, what those technologies could look like, sound like, but I'm sure that women will have very clear requests as to what would make a difference to the way that they want to operate in a day. At the same time, I think, you know, what is great about this whole discussion that's being, that's emerging around diversity and inclusion is that the systems, that the organizational systems will have to adapt. They will have to change so that there are more women making some decisions and, and the system isn't all the same people at the top table making decisions, which hopefully will then impact what you're talking about is what, what else can go within that to support you know being at the table is one thing but actually getting your hands dirty it's really not that difficult you know you think about so many people decide like i need to learn french or i need to yes. learn you know like I, I pick up a new hobby i honestly i just wish like people would treat learning coding or anything to do with technology at least conceptual understanding of it you yes. know and treat it like it's a necessity you know, that yes. it doesn't matter what job you're in. A lot of people in technology sectors are overpaid right now because there is not enough of an understanding. Like it's just because there's a small pool of people. But actually, for example, from my point of view, I feel like my team, even the filmmakers in my team, they all need to learn it because it will open up your mind to my day-to-day -day tasks. Is there something I can automate? It just opens up your mind to a new way of thinking about how to use different tools give you some productivity some some extra time back but also there are many things that are already made that are there that yeah. you can use them that may not necessarily be made for the purpose that you will use them but you can yes. use them and repurpose and i do that all the time you know mm -hmm. i'm like i find some piece of technology that has nothing to do with what i wanted to do but i oh i can use this for this yeah. developing that kind of relaxed way around technology and and just being open to it it can be so helpful but i think that goes right back to what you said at the very beginning of this conversation so about you know what do you do when there's so many priorities and there's so many things that you want to do in a day and i think that's the biggest conversation i'm having with people at the moment is how do i go for the things that are going to make the biggest difference how do i say i need to be 110 percent over here and i actually 65 percent is good enough over here how do i make those decisions so that i'm really doing so if, if i decide right i want to be a lot better at speaking french for example then I can't just decide that. I have to then create a whole habitual practice that enables me to do that, which is what you're talking about. And I think so many of us are so clogged with so many priorities and so many things that we could be doing that that discipline of saying, actually, if I step back and say, what are the three things that are going to make the biggest difference to either my journey through technology and business success or my journey at being a better team leader or my journey at actually leading myself better so that I can actually have the impact that I want in this cause of being better in technology and having more direct contact with the decision makers or be a decision maker, whatever it is, it's going to take some discipline to say, I'm not going to get involved with that. And I do think that many of us are trying to get involved in too many things. And I see that sometimes turn out in a sort of proof, a proof energy that female women, uh, female women, female <laughs> leaders feel like they have to, to say yes to everything. Why do you think that is? Do you think, you know, one of the things that you mentioned in your talk was about a strong dose of self-belief that you were yes. like one of the things that makes a, and I think that I have that to a point that sometimes ridiculous amount of it. And sometimes when I look back, when I was very young, sometimes like I had some unjustifiable self-belief at the time but in retrospect i laugh at myself i'm like what was i thinking like i remember for example one time i watched you know professor brian green who does these series about the quantum mechanics now i'm like i'm i haven't studied physics i was actually terrible at math and physics you know but i was always on a conceptual level so interested so i watched his the whole series and and then i thought you know what i'm gonna write him a letter and like express my opinion about something and I, I wrote him a letter. I found his, his address and I've, I'm sure he never, probably he looked at it and he was just 
threw away and was like, this woman is like, you know, not so something. But I was like very young, I was maybe 18, 19. And I think like in retrospect, that was my self-belief, maybe to a mad level of self-belief that is like, that I have written, like in the past, I have written to Bill Gates like, when I was doing my documentary. And it's like, yeah, it may not happen then, but it could happen one day, you know, like I can totally now see myself having a conversation with Bill Gates or, you know, Elon Musk or whatever, you know, I, I'm like, I'm shooting for the stars. I'm going to do it. Right. And if it doesn't happen, what's the worst that can happen? I've had fun doing it, you know? <laughs> so what you're doing there, Sonia, is you're showing your self-talk. You've just told us what your self-talk is. You know, what's, what, what can go wrong if you, I'm shooting for the stars and if it doesn't happen now, it'll happen later. You know, another person might say, oh God, I've written this letter and no one's responded. So, I mean, each individual will have a different response to that. So, I mean, I, I get a bit frustrated whenever, you know, says we, we've all got to be a bit more self-confident. I don't think it is about that. I think we're operating in a slightly different world. It's about a systemic shift that has to happen. But at the same time, if we're going back to the controlling the controllables, if it is a lack of belief that you you need to find you need to fill that gap then you've just illustrated what a self-talk can do to to get you straight back in the game again mm -hmm. i'm trying to hear what the person in front of me what their self-talk is that's either boosting them to go further forward and stay strong in in where they want to go or is health is ba basically limiting them and you that said takes something, a deliberate effort, right? Mm, you, you said something really interesting to me once. I remember when we were having dinner one day, you said that some people are self-centric and some people are other-centric. Yes. And you said that 99% of people are other-centric. Yes. I'm self-centric. All the things that you say, like, for example, you know, Gary, Gary Vaynerchuk, you know, he always says that the reason why he's so, he's got so much self-confident and has such a great charisma and everything, it's because his mother was really, he says that when I went to school, my mother made me feel like I was the best, good, the best looking person in, uh, in school. And you know, that I was just, and he's actually going to write a book or I don't know if he's writing it or written it. He said that he was writing a book about being perfectly parented. My story is exactly the opposite. As you know, I, yeah. there's that that whole film I made about how my mom came to school and, and thing that happened, you know, she slapped me in the face and then she spat into my face, all that stuff. Mm. Uh, for anybody who hasn't seen it, you go to my LinkedIn, there's a video I've, I've explained. So essentially, my story is exactly the opposite of Gary. So I didn't grow up in a, in a nurturing environment. My parents were not nurturing. They told me that I wouldn't amount to anything. I was really bad at school. I had ADHD. So how is it that somebody, because we talked about the nature and nurture, right, and, uh, and the self, so somebody who could come from a really negative environment and go on to have such level of self-confidence, I can bulldoze my way, I can just like go off and then like, I can break down the mountains. What's the worst thing that can happen? I will yeah. fail. I mean, you know, I'm not a psychologist, but I'm absolutely fascinated with what it is around about human beings like you like others with the same circumstance but have different responses to it and you know I think you know I, I, I began my career in uh, for 13 years working in very challenging comprehensives with you know young people who at the time were being literally coming away from um, as refugee status young people overnight landing in a school I was fascinated with whatever trauma or challenge they had there were some children who were just like absolutely focused on being better or creating a better future for themselves and others who were completely pulled down by it. And it's, it's so hard to understand what the ingredients are within that. But I do think, and I, I would love to ask you this question, there's probably somebody in your childhood or somewhere, somewhere, something or a memory maybe that you've got where you either were encouraged or given some hope or you proved to yourself that through that determination you could actually make something happen i suspect i think there's been many instances yeah. of that uh, you know to a point that i can't quite like there's sometimes it's been by my other friends or at school or because despite my failures at school there's been many instances where uh, very clearly like somebody would have taught me like you will do something great. Like you've got that, you've got that spark. One of the best examples of 
somebody giving me a chance was when I was 19. So um, I started working as a tour guide in Tehran for um, people who came to Tehran from like European embassies. So they had like VIP tours. So I started working as a tour guide. They gave me VIP tours very quickly because I was young and spoke very, uh, very well and was driven and all that. Some of these people that uh, the diplomats, some of them really liked, really liked me. I guess maybe, you know, they saw that drive and all that stuff. When I was 19, uh, this was after the September 11, when there was no tours coming, no tourists coming to Iran all of a sudden. And I was so upset. And one day I cried so much. I was like, you know, I'm not going to have any way to pay for my education because I was paying for my own university and everything. And then the next morning I woke up and I had a letter from uh, the Dutch embassy in Tehran. There was this lady, uh, she was 65 years old. She was like uh, about to retire. She's passed away now unfortunately. Her name was Lucy Bynan. And she, she said that, Somi, we have a vacancy here and I want you to come in for an interview. I immediately called her, went for an interview and out of maybe about, I think, eight or 10 people that were shortlisted, the Dutch ambassador, Mr. Mollinger, gave me a job and he's still on my LinkedIn. And to this date, you know, and he actually commented on me, he said, I knew you were a smart cookie because my company is called Smart Cookie Media. There's just like sometimes some people just believe in you and give you a chance. And that changed my life. So there you go. So, so you've got that source of confidence. I say to all the people that I work with, and I, and, I, and I try to do it really deliberately myself, is hang on to those moments that, yeah. I, I call them trophy moments. Mm-hmm. They're moments that, you know, people, high achievers have trophies. They have ways of tapping into trophies. And I think all of us need those trophy moments or, you know, yay moments or things that actually give you a different energy and a different belief and you can only get your confidence from your past right so how do we spend time connecting to the things that actually give us confidence in the past as opposed to our natural propensity as human beings which is to worry about the things that have gone wrong and that is a deliberate practice like you illustrated earlier on in this in this conversation so it just came out of your mouth Mm -hmm. i'm shooting for the stars i'm doing this you know that's a constant in a dialogue that you you say. And I think when we can really do that and connect to why things matter to us, I call them the bookends. It's like having a really uh, compelling sense of hope about what you want to cause uh, and be part of. And then the other bookend is knowing your solid trophies that are right behind you as a strong foundation. That middle bit about what you need to do and get on with becomes much easier then. Yeah. Because you've got a strong foundation of where you've come from and you've made it a strong foundation, whatever your circumstances, whatever your challenge is, you write the story, right? Yes. And then over here, you've got your compelling hope about where you want to go to and you write the story there as well. So however aspirational, ever since I've known you, you've had a very aspirational future vision of what you want to cause Sony and that has never ever wavered despite all of the things that have come in in the last two or three years that could have knocked you off or could knock someone else off you have not wavered because these two bookends have been absolutely solid for you and the more you make progress the more trophies you put in your trophy cabinet Mm. so you know a lot of the work I'm doing with people is which this is a moving thing right you're moving your future ambition into your trophy cabinet and then you move up and this thing gets much stronger and bigger and this becomes even more attractive Mm -hmm. so this stuff that you have to do in the middle which is tough and difficult and every day you're making you know progress is not doesn't feel like that and it doesn't feel like that for you either because this is so strong and this is so strong and in my view this is the work that we need to do as human beings is to get these two bookends really really strong and this is what i think needs to be in education you know yes. career conversations career conversations from my view should just be like that tell me when you have felt your proudest Yes. Right. Good. Yeah. Put the elements of that. What is it about that story that tells you about your strengths? What is it about that story that tells you about, you know, the lessons that you really, really want to bank about that achievement? That's what we should be saying with our young people right now. Where do you want to go? And I know it's difficult to know where you want to go right now because the world is in turmoil. However, if you know where you want to go and what impact you want to have, just keep Let's ladder that up a bit. Tell me what's happening. Who's speaking to you? Where are you in the world? What conversations are you having? Like you've just said, Bill Gates has been in there all the time ever since you were 18. And one day you will probably, I have no doubt, Somi, speak to this guy. Yeah, one day I'll be having the same conversation yeah. with him, you know? Yeah, and exactly. uh, so I'm a very scientific person. You know, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in so many things. And I, I, I hasten to, to use the term spiritual because, you know, it's got connotations around. There's things that 
I have experience that I don't have an explanation for. Anything that I imagine happens, anything. Since I was a child, you know, I was like, I'm going to go to Europe and study. I'm going to go to New York. I'm going to do this. Everybody was like, in all of my family, nobody has gone outside of their city, uh, their, their hometown. Nobody has gone abroad or anything like that. And I just, I did all of those things. And I yeah. studied in one of the best universities in, in the UK, St. Andrews University. And I uh, ended up with two master's degrees. I did all of these things. And I just think like, I don't know what it is, but uh, it could be that all of the stuff that you talk about in your book, I already naturally do. I, I just wish that I, I really hope to give more women you yeah. know, that, that same kind of... Yeah. Me you know, too. Strong self belief, or for example, in our culture, for example, they have this thing. Um, they say, like, whenever something good is happening to you, don't talk about it, don't tell anybody because it would jinx it. You know, like that, that's their version of um, they use the different terms, but essentially, that's what they're saying. But I've never believed in that. I always say, if you don't believe in something, it's not going to happen. I'm going to just celebrate what's good. If I fail in anything, you know, I actually say that failure, basically the way I look at failure is like, if you think about you have a wall in front of you and you need to uh, pick some of these bricks so that you can open up, you know, the space to, to pass through a failure. All that is, is that, you know, that that's another brick that has taken away. Because it means that that's yeah. one way you don't need yeah. to do, you know, yeah. like, like, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. A, so yes. actually a failure is a success because that's like something that you tick off. Okay. So this one didn't yeah. work. I'm not going to do that again. My, my favorite mantra is, um, energy flows where attention goes. So if you're focusing on your success and you're focusing on what's working and you're focusing on the celebrations, your energy is going to flow towards that. And you're going to either want more of it or you're going to create more of it, but it's certainly going to make you feel better, right? Whereas if we're focusing on all the things that can go wrong, I know there's a lot of talk about failure and how you can actually mine and interrogate failure. I mean, Matthew Slide, you know, Black Box, all of these stuff around failure can be incredibly helpful too. You can learn from failure, right? I think that's really crucial for those businesses. If you're flying or you're a surgeon, you really do need to interrogate when things go wrong because, you know, people's lives are at risk but with our sense of who we are if we're interrogating failure all the time I think it has an energetic impact and a dynamic on your ability to go forward so I think and also we have a natural propensity as human beings to focus on on what's not working because of all of our primitive background in terms of we needed to look out for you know potential foes and and uh, potential lack of food and all those things. So we're programmed to, to, to look out for failure. Therefore, we have to be even more deliberate about focusing on what's working because our natural propensity will not do that. So that has to become a habit. That's the work that I love doing is helping people create the habits that's going to serve them in terms of achieving what they want to achieve. That might mean saying, I'm not going to do that anymore. That's about being deliberate about where you, where you pay attention. Some people have to have real deliberate habits to do that. So I agree with you. I think let's put our energy around the things that are working. And I love that energy of bricks in a wall. You know, it's just one less thing you have to do. Exactly. Uh, exactly. It's just one I, less you know, thing you have to do. With and, and it's a great, I think someone once uh, shared a thing about when I'm, got, when I'm creating something new, I put all of the people that are going to be the most skeptical and most critical in front of me. <laughs> because they will say, oh, we haven't thought about that. And you, you haven't thought about that. And all that does, this person said, is give me all of the areas that I now have to interrogate further. Yeah. So when they, when they tell me it's not going to work, I think, okay, that's what I've got to sort out because mm -hmm. it's gold dust, actually. Yeah. It's gold dust. If you look at it like that, it becomes demoralizing if you take it into an identity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, not, not, not taking, I mean, you need to not take anything personally, you know, for no. me, I, my view of life is life is a game. I'm playing a game and I want to enjoy it. What's the, what's the first reason why you play a game is to enjoy winning yeah. is second, <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. Right. So, so like, of course I'm, I'm playing to win. I always look at myself as like an Olympic athlete. That's, uh, I, I train, I train with the same intensity uh, of an Olympic athlete, but in the business environment, right? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. That's the way yeah. I see it, you know. I think, you know, I was with a team earlier last week and their most useful distinction was, are we playing to win or are we playing not to lose? Hmm. And there's a real difference in there. I want to end with uh, the note that you said in, in the conference around the concept of building your network. 
and having a network, supportive network. That's another thing. Like I say, you know, everything you say in the book, I've been doing it all my life and, and I've naturally been doing it. I just have a talent and I don't, I've never thought about it as a, my network. I always think about it as my friends and my people that I want to have in my life. I, you know, because network, network is a great word, but I think it's become, it's found a bit of a negative connotation with yes, the social media and all that stuff. Yes. But I have a network of friends like yourself that I can, I know that I can reach out to any minute. And I make friends. Like when I go to film a Steinway owner, they become my friends, you know, and I can reach out to them any moment. I stay in touch with people. I make an effort to stay in touch with them. And, and I try everything I do to help them. For example, you said you, from being on the, on the panel last time, you were approached, you got new opportunities. So those, so like, I'm always thinking, how can I create more opportunities yes. for my friends? How can yes. I give more, right? Yeah. How do you go about, because for me, it's kind of difficult to explain how I do it because to me it comes naturally. But if you were to uncode it, is there like a method to uh, building a supportive network at which we talked about how important that is for women? So, yeah. I agree with you about the term network. I love the term boost. I have a belief that if you go into any new situation or environment with a sense of curiosity and a boosting energy to uh, see others, to really see other people, you get back what you give out. I think people in the last four to five months I've seen that a lot over, over social media. It's sort of like there's a lifting up of each other that can happen that I think is A, really, really important. I think it's appreciate and it appreciates. So I think if you look at people, be them men, be them women, be them children, be them people who you come into your orbit, look at what's great about them. Not about what they can give you, but what's great about them and what actually fills you with energy about them something happens in that moment it's like alchemy I think it is I think it's chemical and I think if you go in and I you know talk about people energy it's the energy you give and you receive to other people if you go in as a giver which you've just described I think you find the magic in all sorts of people that combine you and people lean in, people come into you if you go, go into them. If you go in feeling out or either excluded or, you know, not part of this unit or part of this tribe or whatever we want, you will get that back. So it, to me, this is also a practice. And this is also about building your energy so that you come into every interaction with the potential of what can I learn about this person, these people, this group that I didn't know before? Because you're bound to learn something. Yeah. Equally, though, Somi, I think there are people in one's life that are huge drainers. Yeah, so I was going to talk to you about that because, you know, in my book, I talk about there are obviously the five of the ocean model about your personality traits. But then there yeah. are three other things about our relationship with other people. And it basically says that all of our relationships with other people are motivated by three things either it's achievement or it's a power or it's affiliation now for me basically it's a it's like a spectrum so it's not like like more power or, or power less weak no it's like it says like a spectrum of a power or achievement now i think that for me i'm so achievement oriented that all of my friends, even though I'm thinking about how can I benefit them, that's always like my first thought. How can I benefit my um, beauty therapist, my doctor, my you know, everybody? I always think, look, what can I do for them, right? But at the same time, the choice of the people that I allow into my life has yeah. something to do with my achievement yeah. orientation. So if somebody is draining my energy, uh, they just, they probably wouldn't even get there to begin with. I'm yeah. like, I have like a radar for it. I'm like, you know, you're not coming yeah. to my life if you're, if you're going to drain my energy. Yeah. The moment yeah. I feel the sense of it, like the slight sense of it, everybody yeah. else in my life lifts me and I lift yeah. them. So you see, this is, this is great because you can have that choice. What's interesting when you're working with a leader who's got a team or got other people that they're having to work alongside every single day, sometimes they, don't, they can't eliminate these people from their life. So they have to be even more flexible and adaptable, and it's, my, it's a leadership skill as far as I'm concerned, to try and bring the best out of that person to the uh, shared endeavor in terms of what you're going, the gold medal time, you know, whatever it is that we're going after together as a team, how do you get the best out of that person? And that sometimes, there comes a point for some people, some leaders, where they have to have a very 
challenging conversation with them because they're not going to be able to do it or you know they have they've been trying so hard and and actually they can't do it but how do you how does the leader make sure that that one person and it's like when I was a teacher there was always two or three people in a class who'd who got all of your attention they got all of your attention because they weren't behaving or because they you know they were just they were just taking all of your attention. And so these 25 other people in the class didn't get your attention. So I had to, as a young teacher, realize that because that's just not fair. And I think many leaders I see doing the same thing is where is your energy most useful? How can you apply it to the people that are actually going to learn and love learning and want to be better together? And how do you then have a different conversation with those that maybe are unable to do that? It's often that conversation about do we have people in this team who are going to go forward together in the most useful and productive and energizing way together? And if not, you have to have a leadership skill. You have to adapt and, and help that person or not, depending well, on what. Well, you know, I've got an amazing team. I and mean, you know that, you know, my team, you know, mm. they're Lola and Elizabeth and now mm. Krina, and Krina. You know, they're, I have an amazing team. They're, they're really, really, uh, everybody is perfect. But I suppose when your team gets to a point that gets so big that you are not picking people anymore. There's been people coming into our team that didn't match our values and I had to let them go. When your company is like um, hundreds of people or thousands of people, yeah. it's a little bit like, actually you brought something very up, you brought up something very interesting. You mentioned about being a teacher, like then you can't choose the people that are in your class. And I personally wouldn't know what to do there, like at mm. the moment, because I've never been in that position. Yeah. Because I'm so brutal with people that I let into my life, like brutal, you know, I'm like, yeah. the, the slightest uh, sense of you're gonna waste my time, you're out, you know? You know? <laughs> like, um, yeah. like, like I'll give you as much value as I uh, humanly can, but no wasting my time, you know? That's why for me, teaching was, a gift, it's, I call it my MBA in self-leadership and, and leadership generally. I learned so much from those young people about myself and also about them. You and I have had this conversation before, but one of the most startling things for me was to understand why some of the young people that I worked with as a tutor had put on report, you're put on report if you weren't behaving consistently. And then the report would come to the end of the day to me and I would look. And what I found fascinating so many is this one child this 14, 15 year old in front of me, in five periods a day, could be totally brilliant, by, according to some teachers, about wanting to learn, being a positive force in the lesson, being brilliant, and then in two other lessons, was a total disaster, was sent out, was badly behaved. I got intrigued as to what were those classroom leaders doing to elicit the best out of those young people and be a, a classroom leader that actually saw 30, and, but bear in mind there were 30 different individuals there were about 124 different languages spoken in that school. Young people from many different backgrounds. I, I still believe that a teacher in that sort of environment, managing a class of 30 individuals like that is the best leader, is such an accomplished leader to be able to pull the best out of those young people. And when, when they were on report and I had to give them detentions, I did a little year study on what made young people want to learn and what was it that those classroom teachers were doing and I, used, I just had conversations with them for a year and they told me three things. They told me that they wanted to learn with teachers who showed some passion about their subject. So that whole sense of, we've all had them, haven't we? A teacher or a lecturer or, or a leader that's so passionate about what they do that it's contagious and yeah. that you want to get it to. That was number one. The second thing they told me is that they loved learning with teachers who did something interesting with the content. So it wasn't just the same old workshop or the same old book or the same old style of teaching. They had thought about the creativity of applying the content to match the needs of those young people in front of them. And the third thing they told me, and I think this is probably the most profound, is that they, they loved and wanted to learn with teachers where they felt seen, mm -hmm. where they felt significant, where they felt the teacher had taken care to understand the relevance of the learning to their life or to their world. For me, that year was the thing that then pitched brought me out of education to set up Coaching Impact because I thought that's too rich. Though in those three statements or pieces of those insights, that's the same for any leader in my view. Yeah. Any leader in any business 
needs to feel connected to what the cause and the purpose, the passion for why they do what they do. <laughs> they need to think about the content. You know, if I think about the meetings I witness, they're often the same old meetings, people sitting in the same old place with the same agendas, which are usually not very efficient because there's no real intention in the agenda. And it gets a lazy process. Mm -hmm. And what these young people said is, you know, when you can do something creative with content, you can do something interesting with yes. pulling something forward. And I think leaders could be a lot better at seeing the differences of the people that are in front of them and understanding how to get the best out of them. And that, that is a, an exciting, I think, an energizing leadership skill to, to, to do that. So I'm always a teacher at the heart, uh, actually, but I, and I will, as you know, my passion is to get this sort of a self-leadership back right into the heart of young people. But I think those three things are, are important for any, any leader. Yes, absolutely. And when I look at this again, it's something that I, again, comes to me naturally. Like when I, when people come in, they start working with us, they look at just my passion for yeah. what we are doing. You know, it's like, I won't shut up about it. You know, I'm constantly, it's, I'm, I'm yeah. so passionate about it that they're like, oh my God, you know, like there's so much energy in the room constantly. And the yeah. second thing is like, we are always doing something creative, always yes. doing something, you know, unique, different. And you don't, you never have a boring day here. You know, like you're always like uh, the two girls are I can imagine. <laughs> the next door. And like they, like every day they're pushed to their limit, but they love it, you know, because they are always learning new things. And then uh, always making sure that realize that I'm appreciating when they do something yes. well. When something doesn't go well, then I'm like, you know, guys, like we talked about this, you know, like it's very instant and we talk about it right away get it out of the way we don't dwell on it and then the next thing is like everybody realizes that you know we don't want ever to happen again you know that sort of, sort of thing let's recap the things that you said what i was uh, top lining in the three minute part of the panel was to say number one which was connect to purpose connect to a meaning that really fundamentally matters to you and that it's boosted if it's a cause beyond self-interest that you want to do something for somebody that's bigger than you the second point was Try and remain forward focused so that you're not thinking about where things have gone wrong or what you don't want or what the problem is. But actually, linguistically, think forward focused, solution focused. And that is helped by having a strong personal trophy cabinet and a compelling ambition or direction, whatever it is that you want to succeed and achieve in. And having these two bookends really, really strongly. The third thing I mentioned in the panel was being really clear about asking for what you want as opposed to asking for what you don't want. And that does take practice. And I said in the panel, which we haven't spoken so much about in this conversation, but around bossing your brain, which I talk a lot about in the book, but it's really believing that you have choice and that within us, we have a fast and a slow system and our impulses and our urges can hijack our, our behavior unintentionally and often out of conscious awareness. So therefore being aware of that and making sure you have some ways to get that pause mo moment of choice before moving forward. And what helps is to have a practice that you've worked on outside of pressure or challenge that you can then apply in a pressure or moment as well. I think that's a really important point that people often are trying to work with challenge and pressure in the moment when they've not really thought about it beforehand. And if you think of all of the sport, if you think of my background in performing arts, you, you're constantly increasing the pressure so that you can perform at your best when the performance is there. You know, in my world, it's you're on the book, reading your lines, then you have the lines taken away from you, then you're in costume, then you're on the stage, then you've got the lights, then you run the show for the first act, then you run, and you slowly, slowly, you're increasing, you're disrupting your ability to be able to manage the pressure so that on the first night, the curtain opens and you're absolutely well ready for it. And yet, what I think we do sometimes as human beings is we find ourselves in those moments of high challenge pressure and we've not thought about increasing the pressure, which I think you do very well all the time in every every day so me for yourself and then we talked about people support you know having your whether we call it network but we have our boosters we have our people around us that's going to lift us up and we're going to lift them up men and women children and you know whatever whoever they are uh we've got we, we understand who's boosting and we go into those interactions boosting as well and I think the final thing, which we've not talked about actually, well, we did, we started the conversation about this, is knowing that you've got the fuel in your tank to yeah. actually go on this journey that you're wanting to go in and being really properly selfish about your shed habits, your basics, your, your sleep, your rest, your hydration, your exercise, your movement, your diet, whatever it is, 
know that you can actually put the quantity of energy required in your system to achieve what it is that you really want to achieve. And it's all possible if we make sure that we have the habits in place and we pay attention to things that fundamentally matter and say no to the things that actually don't matter so much. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was very, very uh, nice talking to you, Anna. And I'm going to pretty much put the whole conversation in. I don't think there's <laughs> much editing because I think it was so useful. Lovely to talk to you. Yeah. Speak soon. <laughs> bye. 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 I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Sarah Monroe. And now it's time to dedicate today's podcast to another woman who deserves to be remembered as a role model to us and the future generations. Katherine Johnson was a mathematician whose calculations of orbital mechanics as a NASA employee were critical to sending the first Americans to space. Let's find, recognize, and celebrate women for their contribution. It's the only way that we can change the narrative of history. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe on iTunes or Spotify and YouTube and help spread the word for our common mission.